Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Um, so I, I remember Caitlin was complaining about the slot before lunch. And now I think this is worse, unless you guys prove it otherwise. <laughs> OK, so we're going to start with a little bit of trivia. I'm going to ask you some questions. And uh, if you know the answer, you need to stand up. And then just give me the answers. And if you do, I have some very delicious candy bars, which you deserve after lunch and after half a day of a conference. All right. Um, so very simple. If you know the answer, just stand up. Yeah? And I'll be the judge of who stands up first. You can use your phone if you would like to figure out what's the answer. But I, I don't think it's so difficult. But, but you can do that. You can use that as an aid. All right. Um, so what was the first talk today, the first speaker? Who was it, and what did they speak about? It was, uh, so my name is Kim. Okay. Yes, Kim. <laughs> Woohoo! OK, uh, who invented the graphical user interface, and when? The GUI. You can use your phone. Or call a friend. <laughs> oh. No one? Yes. That's wrong, sorry. Yes. Yes. And when? No, no. <laughs> That's okay. So no one, in the, no one is in the mood to actually look at their phone and then figure this out. 1973. Gentleman over there, thank you. Okay, and who, uh, okay, when was the World Wide Web, WWW, invented? No one? Do you mind if I help you? Yes. I can just this one. Okay. You can use your phone. <laughs> yes. The lady over there. And then the very last one, I hope we all know this. Who is the author of Design of Everyday Things? You have to stand up. You have to stand up. Yes. OK, great. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Um, I see that no one was really using their phone. Uh, but there was a research done. And it was about seven years ago. It was published in the journal Science, which talks about how we have a lot of reliance for information um, on Google or any other kind of technology or search engines. And the, the study actually looked at how it's altering our brain. And it does. So what's happening is uh, our focused attention is reducing. And we are relying a lot. And I think this may happen with you when you're trying to recollect something. What's the first instinct that you have when you're trying to remember something? Yes, I bet, right? Like most of the time, we pick up the phone. So what's happening is it's altering our brain. And we're getting over-reliant on the devices, which is not necessarily bad. Because the article was named, Is Google Making Us Dumb? Um, and I know that there was a question in, the, in Gideon's talk about, are we getting lazy? So what that article said is that, even though we have a lot of reliance on technology for retrieving information, what's happening is all the neurons in our brain, which were given this task of retrieving information, now are free to do bigger things in life, to do creative thinking, uh, to do something better for the society, theoretically. But what do we do with all those the freed space in our memory. Fill it up with cat, cute cat videos from YouTube. No one? Yes. Um, anyways, uh, we'll, let's meditate on that, and we'll bring it back in the talk later, uh, how technology is influencing us, and uh, how, as, as a society, when we're moving forward, that we need to be conscious of it. OK, my name is Prakriti. I'm part of the user experience and design team at DBS. When I joined, 
in 2016. Um, it was 12 of us, and one of the girls is here, Serene. She was the only girl at that time in the team, and I was the second one or third one. Uh, but now we are, we are 38. It's an in-house design team, um, and the team is basically designing anything digital that the customers see. So of, I hope everybody has a DBS account here, and you're using mobile banking. <laughs> uh, so mobile banking, internet banking, Payla, we have apps for high net worth clients. So anything that the customers see digitally is pretty much designed by this in-house team. We are very proud of it. Um, <clears throat> so before we talk about how to keep it human in a world where everything is getting automated, digital, technologically advanced, let's, I think it's, it's important that we look back in the future and how this technology has actually helped us. And I thought we'll just quickly go through some of the technology breakthroughs that we have had that have actually uh, affected, or, or in, a, in, a, in a better way, in, in a positive way, the design of UX, I mean, the history of UX design. So if I had to ask you, like, what is something in the last 50 years, a breakthrough that has really impacted us now as UX professionals? What will that be? Anyone in the last 50 years? Smartphones? Anything else? GPS navigation, yes. That screens, yes. Great, so all of these definitely, uh, just rewinding a little back, 1436, Gutenberg. Um, he invents the movable type, and what he did is he produced like mass production of books and made it available for uh, the society to basically uh, learn and educate. Now, this straight off society didn't have access to education at that time. So he made it possible, and then it was, it was great as an invention. <coughs> Telephone, or any kind of telecommunications for that matter. There's some debate here, but Alexander Graham Bell was the first one who actually created... No, you don't disagree? Okay. Uh, but he was the first one who created a working prototype or a functional prototype of the telephone. And what was interesting is that telephone, it actually changed the way humans physically interact with the tool for communication. So after the telephone, the whole experience around communication changed. <clears throat> GUI, much later in future, but uh, even though the bitmap images, they look very primitive right now, but at that time, the whole windows and uh, uh, the text editor was quite groundbreaking. And then, of course, the World Wide Web, which changed our experience of connection. So the thing that phone did in terms of communication, but the World Wide Web did in terms of connection with people all around the world. And then, of course, we have to talk about iPhone, because it introduced the whole touch interaction and how intuitive it could be. So there are many more, of course. But what is something that's common across all of these different breakthroughs? Any one thing that's common across these, the five that we saw? I'm sorry? Innovation? Unprecedented, OK. Apart from the fact that, yes, they are, they involve interaction between a human being and a technology and they made it easier. So yeah, sure, some of those things, it made it possible to do things that was previously not possible. But not only that, they made it for the betterment of the society. You can argue that some of these inventions have also created problems, but we'll talk about that in a different conference. Um, so in this, all of these inventions, they have actually tried to solve a very real problem. And ultimately, they were the purpose was really to improve people's lives. So I think there's something to learn from these breakthroughs. Whereas now, with you know, this whole digital world, let me ask you, how many times or recently have you experienced frustration while using a piece of technology? How many? Recently, have you faced any fr frustration? That's all. That's not bad, actually. 
Uh, so even though we have had a lot of positive influence with technology, we, things have also become very complex. And I know Gideon touched upon some of that, the previous speakers as well. <clears throat> this is my favorite example. A digital microwave of 2018 has 36 controls. And it's very smart because all stuff like popcorn and potato and pizza, it's been preset for the time. And I can just stick it in and it'll be warm. But what's happening here is, what's the, a user's main jobs to be done with a microwave? What is it? M Most of the time, yes, it's warming, reheating. Most of the time. I mean, you can argue that I use it for baking a cake as well. But most of the times, it's, it's warming. Uh, so how might we do that using this? Any guesses? It depends. I like the answer. That's what we all say when business asks or something. It depends. <laughs> Let me tell you what it depends on. Um, but yeah, of course, like the, I don't know, the 30 second, that's the one that I use most of the time, and the rest, 35. Uh, the, the buttons, they are just not used. Rewind back, microwave of the 1970s. Two controls. I put the food in, I set the time, and if needed, temperature. So what happened from 1970s to 2018? At least in, in the context of microwave, we've probably gone backwards. We made the interaction complex in the name of smart device. So I think that is something that we need to be consciously aware of. Um, let me show you another quick example. This one's <clears throat> talking about using voice. Um, it's like a voice-activated smart home. Ah, sorry. See? Okay, now. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, come back at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. So, so ska vi sätta en till? Ah, ja. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open. Oh, door. Repeat that. Oh, door. I didn't understand that. Hey, oh, door. Play on the floor. Sink on the floor. It's the floor. Oh, door. 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 It is an exaggeration. <clears throat> Just give me a minute while I get back to this. Uh, of course, it's an exaggeration, but something that some of the newer technologies, are, as they're getting, they're getting better, of course. You know, we are teaching them and we are giving them a lot of information to learn about the environments. But something that they're still struggling with is dealing with abnormalities. So even in the video, it was because the voice uh, was not really the right voice, right? It changed and therefore uh, the system had difficulties understanding. So that, that happens even, I mean, there's a lot of examples out there where this whole idea of abnormalities and not being able to process that abnormality and then come up with a solution, that's, that's missing. And then we're working towards it. <clears throat> so there's a really nice article by Don Norman. It's called The Human Side of Automation. If you do get a chance, have a read. I'm sure people from Tesla and other self-driving car manufacturers may not like it. But he talks about this whole idea of what humans are good at and what systems or machines are good at. So for instance, humans are very good at pattern recognition, uh, dealing with abnormalities, like to process the situation and then come up with a solution. 
uh, whereas we are not very good at a focused attention for a long time. And I can already see that because 10 minutes into the talk, the energy is dipping slowly. But we are not good at that. But that's what machines are good at. So he talks about this whole idea that, let's say with the, and, and this has been around for a while, and he talks about how in aviation, you have the autopilot, right? That is a way to automate. But the, the way it works is uh, the automation only takes care of easy things. And if there is any abnormality or if there is anything that they are not capable of taking care, they immediately pass it on to the, the pilot. Now, the difference is in an aviation industry or in an aviation scenario, you still have, I don't know, 20 minutes before the plane comes crashing. Uh, you have some time and the, and the pilots are really trained. They've been trained for six months to deal with a situation like that. So it, it, it's still it's working and we should learn from that. Whereas let's say in a um, driverless car, uh, what's happening is parts of it are automated. And then the other parts, you know, we still have the control on the drivers. But what happens is that makes us complacent. Because now we're like, okay, yeah, let's just, we'll, we'll let the car drive. And then we have very few, I don't know, milliseconds, seconds to process, let's say if there's going to be an accident. And then you have to process and quickly act on it. And that, that is a recipe for disaster because it is going to lead to an accident. So anyways, I won't talk more about it. If you're interested, please read this article. It's, very, it's fantastic. But uh, the whole notion of that we need to aim for collaboration and not supervision. So as humans, we should not be telling and supervising, let's say, the AI, but how do we work together with them? Things they are good at, things we are good at, and then it, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a better, it's a good marriage. <clears throat> so by 2020, 2020 Gartner uh, predicts that there's going to be six intelligent devices or things for every human in the planet. So that's great, right? Because remember what we spoke about before. So a lot, lot many neurons are going to be free. So we can do more things. Uh, but that also means in a world where it's getting very, very digital and very, very automated, how might we keep things human? How, how might we still go with this idea that we are all connected and we are all humans? <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about a few tips, a few things that we can do. There's no, there's no clear-cut answer here, but I'm a researcher, so I'm going to put a model together, and then we can follow that. So just like any design um, process, we need to look for the right problem. And that's in context, I mean, we do that even otherwise, but more so when we are dealing with automation or technology, we need to look for the right problem. What happens is a lot of time, let's say tech entrepreneurs, they are very excited about this nifty technology and they're like, okay, we have this, how do we use this? And that's not really the right way to approach, right? The approach is what is the user trying to achieve or how can we make it better for them, or how can we improve their lives, and then see, okay, can this technology really help us? So I think it's important that we do the process right. This is an example from Capital One, where they, they tied with Alexa, and then there were many uh, financial services that Alexa can now do, like pay your credit card bill, look at your balances, um, remind you if a bill is due, and so on and so forth. Now, let's say for this specific scenario, pay your credit card bill, it sounds like, yeah, that could be cool if I'm multitasking, and their ad is also like that, you know, the woman is multitasking, and then she says, hey, Alexa, pay my bill. But if you look at the journey, it actually asks you a couple of questions before Alexa can do it. So Alexa will ask you, hey, so what's the password? So then you say the password. Then Alexa asks you, okay, so which bank account do you want to use to pay the credit card bill? Then you would say that. And then finally, you know, it's paid. So the question is, is this the right problem to solve? So we know Alexa is great with voice, right? It's the technology is about voice. And the way we are using it is to pay a credit card bill. So is that the right problem to solve? Because right now, if I go to my mobile app, I follow roughly the same number of steps to do it. So yes, it made it easier by a notch, but what value did it add? So I think we need to always question what is, what is that 
problem that we're trying to solve. Because if voice is a unique identifier, maybe the way to use technology would be, I just use my voice to identify. You don't have to ask me for the password. And you know, and then you, you pay it. So the, and then there's this whole idea of first principles thinking by Brett King. You know, it always talks about what is that technology good at, or, or really break it down, and then try to see how you can use it. I'm just going to bring one example from DBS. Um, so in 2016, we launched an app called DigiBank in India. It was a completely digital bank. That means it's a mobile app, and you can open an account without any signatures or physical forms. So at that time, it was quite revolutionary, because in India, no one did that before. <clears throat> so of course, we were trying to be revolutionary. That was there. But one of the problems that we were also able to solve is, and I was there, I was doing research, and I spoke to this uh, one customer who had recently downloaded the app, and he told me that his mom lives in a village, and um, she doesn't have a bank account, she's illiterate. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to open a bank account for her, because she has a smartphone. So she definitely has a smartphone, and then all you need is the app on the phone, and then I can, I can easily transfer money to her. So. That's, that, that, that was one moment where I felt, oh, okay, I think we are solving the right problem. That doesn't happen very often, I should be honest, even in DBS. <laughs> but that was one instance where I was like, oh, yeah, okay, finally, we are solving the right problem. So I think it's, it's incumbent on us to really think about, are we solving the right problem? Second, <clears throat> another way we can be human is by letting... Um, so something that humans are lousy at is memory, right? We tend to forget things. And technology is good at that, because they can process a lot of information for a long time and remember it. So the idea here is that can, can we then help users to realize something that they are not even aware of? So the whole idea of blind spots is you don't know what you don't know. And if we can do that, because we have so much access on, of data now, right? especially for banks. Sorry, a lot of my examples are bank-related, uh, but it's, it's very applicable to other fields as well. Uh, so because we, you know, we tend to forget things like, this, this is a great example, like subscriptions. When was the last time you, know, you had a subscription and you had forgotten about it? Does that happen? Right? And then it rolls over, then you're like, oh, damn, I still have to pay. I'm not even using that service. So this is a great example from Clarity Money where they actually help you realize that, hey, these subscriptions, do you, do you think you really need them or cancel them? So there is a principle here, right? Because I'm helping you by giving you this information. I'm helping you discover a blind, blind spot. And therefore, it becomes meaningful for you then. So blind, this whole idea of blind spots is actually quite powerful. And we, tr we try to use that in DBS as well. We've not been very successful. But hopefully in the next two to three years. Um, something that we did with retirement in DBS is uh, we created, so th there's a lot of fears, not necessarily fears, but people are uncomfortable talking about retirement. That's what we found in Singapore. And then um, also they are not very clear on how much you need to save because a lot of times when you do a calculator, it tells you like a ridiculous amount, like some million dollars that you need to save. So we try to reimagine how we could present the information. And we figured that one of the blind spots people have is that they're not even aware of, like, let's say, based on how much I'm spending today, how that would, with inflation, change in 20 years or 25 years. So this was a tool that we created, and then uh, that, that helped users to actually look at their existing spending. And if you want to maintain this lifestyle, then how much you might need, and then how do you work towards it? This is another example from Simple Bank talk about the safe to spend idea. So after your expenses and after your bills and everything, uh, how much money do you still have that you can save? All right. So we had the first one, which was, uh, you know, look for the right problem. Second one, help discover blind spots. And the third one, how many of you have heard about positive computing? OK, so this was a term that was made popular by Rafael Calvo and Dorian Peters. It's a, it's a very good book. You can have a look at that. It just, it didn't, it didn't take up. It, they introduced this term in 2015, but somehow it has not 
really taken on, I'm guessing because there's lack of examples. But what they talk about is, again, the same way, like when was the last time you could make a strong connection with, let's say, a loved one because of technology? I'm sure you can think of some, right, in the past. So the whole idea is, um, through time, with the technological advances, yes, our, our salary and, and maybe we have a better, uh, we, we have more money, but in terms of happiness, we're still the same. And it talks about how we should use technology to actually improve well-being. Talks about meaningfulness, empathy, um, and talks about these three psychological needs, which is autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So we can only be psychologically satisfied if we feel we are competent, meaning we have mastery over some sort of an art, the specialist maybe, I don't know, or generalist. Whatever we feel is like we, have, we are master of that. Autonomy, which is the sense of having control over your life. And then the third one is relatedness, which is the sense of belonging. So if we are satisfied or, or if you're getting enough on these three parameters, you should be psychologically satisfied and that should lead to a good well-being. Um, so the book talks about how can we do that when we design or when we look at technology, how can we use the technology to actually get people to those satisfied stages. I'm going to show you an example of uh, Google Photos. This is my older boy. And they did this video and they sent it to me, the, the Google Photos assistant, and the title was, They Grow Up So Fast. I was actually quite surprised that they got all the correct photos. I was just surprised. I was like, wait, because my other boy looks very similar to my older boy as well. They're three and six. But they actually got all the photos of my older guy, and then they stitched it together in a video. And then, of course, like any, uh, any mom out there, I was like, oh, you know, I, I didn't have the time to do it, but that's great. And, and you know, they, they, they managed to I invoke the positive emotions, right, in me, in a nice way. Even though it's not that value-adding, but the point is they were able to create that sense of joy for me in that moment. So that's great. And if we can do things like that, with technology, because this is technology in a way, right? Like they looked at all the, I don't know, millions photo, trust me. There are many photos that I have in Google Photos. And then they picked these out and they stitched the story together. So I think they were spot on there in terms of evoking positive emotions. <clears throat> While we wait to actually make technology very, very, in terms of Rafael, like the positive computing aspect, we can try to at least do moments of happiness, just like the way Google Photos did. So while we wait to actually create something that's very meaningful and powerful and adds, brings value to people's life, um, till then at least we can try and focus on maybe just moments of joy or moments of, and I'm just going to show, I'm a bit biased, I'm going to show DBS's example. Um, the Pela app was redesigned, and the designer's actually here if you want to meet him later. Uh, but one thing that, so paying some money to someone is a very, I mean, there is the mundane task of it, and then there's also the whole idea of, I don't want to be in debt, so I want to pay money. And you feel good once you pay the money back. So we wanted to put in some micro interactions that actually when you, after you pay money, it, it evokes that little joy. And then we managed to do that because we get a lot of reviews where people love the fact of the little aeroplane going with the noise. So again, it may not be very value adding at this point, right? You can argue. But it's just small moments of joy that, again, evokes the positive emotions. Uh, that's another example of a virtual teller machine. So although we want to be totally digital, but it's very hard. And we know that everybody, I mean, we, we still get many calls. People just love to pick up the phone. It's just, it's an easy thing to do rather than trying to figure it out, right? You choose the path of least energy. Uh, so this was one solution that we have around, you can, there, there are a bunch of them out there where you can go in and you can actually talk to an actual teller. This is not the skew-morph, skew-morphed, yes, not what is an actual teller uh, on a video uh, conferencing, which, which works quite well as well. 
Just another example uh, before we wrap up. Another thing that DBS is currently working on is how do we, as a society or as, as an overall country, how do we improve the financial health of people? And I know um, in the previous talk, you guys spoke about forecasting, because that's something that if that's a very powerful tool, if people can really see what's going to happen in the future, that could lead them to take an action. So going with that and this whole idea of positive computing and not making it very negative in terms of, hey, you're not saving and loss aversion. And so we do that as well. But primarily it was to put the whole financial planning into a concept that people would easily understand. And then we came up with this whole idea of sale, which is just like a boat where you have emergency savings as a hull and the, your investment is the, um, the, the, the sale. And, the, and then we tried to show customers that what your state is right now and then what it could be. Like there were different islands, which are the goals you were moving towards them. Um, so again, we got, we got some success here, but of course it's not, it's live right now, but needs a lot of improvement. But this was another way we tried to create those moments of joy. All right, that's pretty much all I have. Um, and I think something that I wanted everyone to take away with them after this talk is really this whole idea that how can we use technologies to empower us rather than just making a simple thing simpler. So it's, it's not just about that, but how can we really empower ourselves as a society? And also this whole idea of because we have all of these neurons which are now uh, available, how can we then use them for creative abilities and bring happiness to our life. All right, that's all. I have a lot of time, I see. These are some good reads, uh, if you guys would like. Uh, the first two books and then the one on uh, Don Norman's, he has a website with a lot of really relevant articles. All right, that's a wrap for me, if you guys have any questions. All right, we're gonna bring up a slido meter uh, we would have a few questions. All right, the first question. How does positive computing oh impact God. the privacy concern we face today? Okay, sorry, I couldn't get off the third question. <laughs> um, how does positive impact the privacy concern we face today? Um, so positive computing is also about feeling safe and uh, yeah, this whole feeling of safety and being comfortable as well. So if, if I understand the question correctly, how can we still make people feel safe, is that correct? So who, who asked that question? We want to know how, how, is that correct? Is that what you want to know? How do we still make people feel safe uh, with positive computing? Okay, um, that's a good question. And I, I think even, I mean, it's not to say that if something is joyful, it's not safe. So it's, it's not really that, but as long as we can get that emotion or we can evoke that emotion from the users that, hey, you're in safe hands, but even if you did it in a positive way, it should work. But I don't have any examples for you right away. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. We have to get to that question now. Oh, no. What conditioner you use, Prakriti, you have to tell us. <laughs> we really love your curls. Guess who asked that question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the shampoo, if possible. <laughs> oh, Pastor, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, how did DBS design the Know Your Customer process for its mobile app? Anything you think your team had effectively optimized? Okay. Who asked that question? It's okay. Uh, I can give you an example of India, if that helps. For Digibank India, uh, as I said, it is a paperless sign up. So the way we did that is using, um, uh, in India they have an identity card, it's called Aadhaar. 
So they had to key in their number and then they were all set. You get all the information in terms of their addresses and uh, a lot of other information from that. But we also had to, I mean, the government does ask you to have a, a visual ver in-person verification. So that still needs to be done. So we actually tied up with a lot of cafes in, in the city. So customers could either pick an option where they go to the cafe and then the baristas there were trained to do the in-person verification or they could call somebody home. So then somebody would, then we tied up with this third party um, agency who went to their house to, uh, we were we still trying to optimize that process. And now with videos, uh, we are trying to see if we can use that. But the government says that it has to be an in-person verification. I think that's where the laws are stopping us right now. Okay. All right. What are some humans versus automation challenges your team faces working in a bank? Who asked that question? I think it's okay. I mean, the reason you have Slido is <laughs> you don't have to say who asked. <laughs> um, okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, one, uh, the, the, very, the one challenge that we face as a bank is this whole idea of having the call center, right? We have, we have people there and s somehow even if we have gone very digital, uh, we still have a volume of calls which comes in because people want to talk to somebody and they don't want to really do it themselves. Not that they don't want to do it themselves, maybe it's difficult as well, right? It's, it's a lot of cognitive load to go and find things out. Um, so the way we are trying to do uh, have maintained that is we are not going with the notion that everything must be digital. So every time when there is, you know, we have this excited business for folks, um, sometimes they come to us, like for instance, for the chatbot. Uh, right now in our mobile banking app, we have a chatbot. And uh, one of the things that the business guys had in mind is like, same, same, same thing as Alexa. Can we use it to transfer money to somebody? Let's, I'm like, but it's already, I mean, you're inside the app, you've logged in and you want to pay money, you transfer money to someone. How difficult is that? But we still wanted a chatbot there to do it. So I think those are the times when we really try and with whatever knowledge and whatever validation we have, the research that we have, we try to tell and educate uh, that maybe you don't have to always automate everything. So, so that's the way we are, we are trying to balance it out. Does that answer your question? Anonymous person? I actually asked because I was hoping you might have ah. more chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this is the last question. Um, what is some, uh, sorry, how can we make sure that the positive computing align with business needs? How do we make sure positive com computing aligns with business needs? Um, so what we're trying to say is sometimes we, we might want to create an interaction that's just joyful but maybe it's not really making us money, right? And we face that a lot as well. Um, and that's where we go back to research and we tell, and there is a lot of research to prove that. The longer you can keep people on your app or the longer you can keep them on your website, the more likely they are to convert. So what positive computing does is it'll keep you there if you did it right. And then it'll help you to discover more and more content in a positive way. So you have to tie it like that. Thank you so much, Prakriti. Do we have yeah. any other question on the floor? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi. I, I, hi. I understand that DBS have a really large design team. Uh, I want to ask, right, uh, 10 years ago, normally customers only have uh, a website. But nowadays, they have a website, they have a corporate website, they have a micro site, they have a mobile product, they have so many products. Mm. I want to ask, how do you guys manage to ensure the consistency of design across all the product lines? That's a very challenging problem nowadays we are facing because the customers do not have only one website. Now they have well, so many teams across different teams. How to ensure that all the products are consistent? Do you have a system or something like that? Uh, yes, that's a great question and we are working towards a system like that. Um, so something that the whole design team consciously does because we worked across many different products and services and many different channels per se, like let's say you know, we have the website, we have the app. 
So one thing that consciously the team does is whenever there is, let's say, uh, something needs, a new feature is going to be on the mobile banking app. So I think something that we consciously do is we try to see um, how does that affect the different touch points that the customer has. So we, always, we already have customer journeys mapped out for the different user tasks. So what we do is we go backwards and then we see that, okay, if I'm going to add this new feature, uh, how does it affect the interaction on the website versus on the mobile bank versus Payla or any of the other apps? Um, and then the main thing to do is to talk to each other uh, and to talk to the business folks and keep everybody in the loop. So which we consciously try and do that. Uh, the other thing, uh, the team is structured into, we have the user research and insights. We have the design team uh, who work on different core experiences. But then we also have a design language and system, systems team. Um, so the, the team is really responsible to make sure that all the components, all the experiences, as much as we can, we standardize across the platforms. So that when you go into a mobile app, you started something, you left, and you went into an internet banking, at least you still feel familiar and it's not like a totally different territory. So that's the other way we, try, we are trying to build a system that, that supports uh, the journey, the customer journey. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much, Prakriti. You've definitely evoked a lot of positive energy <laughs> here. Thank you for bringing Thank you. us chocolates.